Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for being eight minutes late. I didn't know where I was. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be next door. And uh, so talk about being dazed and confused. I resemble that remark today. <laughs> but thank you. Um, um, uh, I'm honored to be here today, obviously. And uh, it's the most difficult speaking to fellow SF men. And uh, so bear with me if I stumble a little bit. But um, just to start off uh, with my a short little personal history, and then uh, at any point as I'm talking, if I see a hand pop up with a question, I prefer, we're just working together here, to, I'm happy to stop and answer any question along the way. Um, so basically, in uh, 1966, I was working in Yosemite National Park. It took me two years to flunk out of college. <laughs> so dad goes, you're out. The, the draft board's coming for you. And right about the time that that letter came from my dad, I read the book, The Green Berets. Huh. I didn't realize how uh, significant that was. <laughs> but um, upon reflection, read that book, I said, these guys are crazy. And if I can go to Vietnam, I want to go with them. Because at that time, um, people that were getting drafted they were going in eight weeks of basic training, eight weeks of AIT, a month R&R, &R, and they were in Vietnam. Well, I was a damn city slicker from Trenton, New Jersey. I grew up on a milk truck with my dad, and I knew that this boy needed more training than just eight weeks in basic and AIT. So uh, during AIT, and this was 1967, I was down at Fort Gordon, and uh, between March and April, the SF recruiter came out. And we were, we had one of those rainy days classes where we were in an auditorium with over 600, 700 people. And everybody was sitting on the floor. And this was the day when people came in talking about their MOS. Now, become a cook. You get the best food in the world. You'll never be hungry. Be a comma guy. Be this, be that. Anyways... And, and the stage had staircases on each side, and all the other legs came up this way. The last person to speak was a little banny rooster, and it was raining out. It was a banny rooster, Green Beret. He walked in, did a vertical jump to the stage, turned around, and said, we're looking for recruits for special forces. I'll be in the back. Who wants to volunteer? Well, I read the book. I jumped up off the floor. Oh, airborne, sir, I'll be here. And I looked around, there's only about four or five other guys. And I'm going like, are you crazy? Anyway, so we did it. And uh, I went through the process and at the very end, the recruiter goes, <clears throat> you're lucky, Meyer. They lowered the standards. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that, we went to jump school, went to Fort Bragg. And of course, you all have probably been through, pick, any SF men here have probably been through that experience. If you uh, came through at that time, they were what they called then was the baby SF program. And uh, so basic AIT, jump school, right into training group. And we didn't realize we were like unprecedented. We had read the book, and in the book it said you had to be in for five, ten years, have rank, et cetera, et cetera. But hey, if they're willing to let us in, let's go. So we arrived at Fort Bragg, we get there at night, we get off the bus, and everybody jumps off the bus. You know, we've been in training for those last couple of months and we figured to get hassled. So out comes a guy with a clipboard, t-shirt, shorts, and sandals and goes, welcome to a Special Forces Training Group. Your barracks are over here, we'll have sandwiches for you at the mess hall, and we'll see you Monday morning. I go. Monday morning, don't you, aren't you going to mess with us? <laughs> aren't you going to force us to do push-ups or, or something? This is special forces. And that was the beginning of a different life. And one that I've uh, been a proud member of for a long time. So we went through um, the training. And, and during our combo training, Morse code, I have a tin ear. 
So I, I, had, I got recycled along with Rick Estes. I don't know if Rick did, but Rick Estes, Johnny McIntyre, Tony Harrell, and a few of us got recycled. Our combo trainer was a Sergeant First Class, Paul Villarosa. He had had three tours of duty already, and this is 1967. He had three tours of duty already in, uh, in Vietnam with Special Forces. He had a uh, tattoo across his neck, cut here. <laughs> he was great, and he was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And uh, Paul, uh, he held training on the weekends, and he could do combo, Morse code, with both hands at the same time. He could take it and receive it. So he was just an amazing trainer. He worked at nights with us. So anybody wants to be here at night, well, we wanted to, we wanted to get this get the training. Nights and weekends, he got us through. We graduated. Uh, we all went to a TDY for 12 weeks at Fort Disgusta, Georgia. And uh, while, we were, while we were there, uh, McIntyre and I got demoted. We, went, we had some issues with the uh, butter bars in charge. Anyways, we landed in Vietnam at the end of April. First night in the Trang, um, mortars came, they mortared us. The barracks next door, they had KIAs from the Indig. And it was like, welcome to the war. Of course, we ran downstairs to the weapons room, which was locked. And so we had to go out to the wall. It was just a, uh, it was just a uh, mortar harassment thing, but it was like, welcome to the war. And so when we had gone through training group, some of the men there had said, um, they had had tours, multiple tours. And they said, when you go to Vietnam, you guys are young. Go to an A camp, learn about the customs, and at the end of the in-country training, some little guy's going to come out and ask for volunteers for a project. Don't do it. Those guys are all get killed. Go to an A camp. And when we read the book, we knew what the A camps were, and they, they, those Green Berets earned their pay out there, those A camps. So sure enough, at the end of the uh, in-country training, <laughs> Guy comes out, we're looking for volunteers. So Johnny McIntyre goes, for what? Sorry, either you're in or you're out. Well, at that time, it was Mac V. Sog. Two days later, we're up in Da Nang, got the briefing, and uh, we sat down. We, being good students, we pulled out our pads and pens and uh, ready to take notes. And the sergeant major comes out and says, put that shit away. This is a top secret briefing. On your desk, each of us had a uh, document. It says, read the document and sign it if you want to stay in. For 20 years, you can't talk about this operation. You can't talk to your mother, your girlfriend, or anybody. Welcome to the secret war. So we all signed it, and then he pulled the curtain down off the map. And here's Vietnam on one side with Vietnam. I-Corps, II-Corps, III-Corps, IV-Corps and then Laos and Cambodia, and they all had target boxes. And this is the secret war. And that was our introduction to it. And during that briefing, <clears throat> somebody had mentioned, did you hear about Sergeant Villarosa? He was KIA in January of 68. Our hero, the man who months earlier had gotten us through the training, was KIA. He was the first... Uh, one of, if not the first teams to insert into Laos. They got hit, and they got hit hard. At some point, the NVA came out with a flamethrower and torched his body, and they kept one of the Americans alive and let him return so he could tell the rest of us about what we were up against in the secret war. So that was our welcome to the secret war. From there, uh, we had the briefing. There was a safe house in Da Nang. We stayed there an extra night. And some men came in, at the, either Delta Force or Mike Force, I, I don't remember. And Johnny McIntyre, we're just as green as grass green berets with our new fatigues and everything. And these guys are coming back. They're all sweaty and dirty. And they're talking about they had helped somebody. It may have been a SOG mission in the Asheville. I'm not sure. But we're sitting there going, we are really going to die. 
<laughs> we know this is bad, bad. So that, we went up to Da Nang, and here's, a, here's another culture shock. I mentioned this yesterday uh, at the Kingby uh, Forum, but when we did all of our training, it was always on UEs, or when we did something in country training, they had some brand new helicopters they were experimentally training with, so it's like, okay, this is, uh, I forget the nomenclatures, these things were ugly, but we're used to the UEs. Here sits an H-34 Sikorsky King B. And it had, we, we were never told about these things, let alone they're gonna be flown by the South Vietnamese Air Force. And it's like, whoa. And then, if you haven't heard it, uh, when, it, when they, the, the engine in a CH-34 is a B-17 engine from World War II. It's a nine-cylinder engine and for the first two or three minutes, it just coughs and sputters, literally. <coughs> it's coughing and sputtering before all nine cylinders get warmed up and really get gone. And so we get in the helicopter. We're flying up to Fubai, up Highway 1. And there's, th there's three of us in the helicopter. And we're going up, and we're sitting at the left door, looking out the right door. There's no left door, I'm sorry. We're settling up against the wall. And we're going up, we come up, go past the second Arvin training battalion, and all of a sudden, boom, this thing is on its side, and we're looking straight down at Highway 1. <laughs> and then the KB did a swirl, came back, and landed. But that was our introduction to, uh, to FOB1. When we got off the helicopter, a recon team got on, and it was Spike Team Idaho. They inserted into Laos. And today, they remain amongst the 50-plus uh, Green Berets who are still missing in action in Laos. We never heard another word from Two or three days later, Spike Team Oregon with George Sternberg and Mike Tucker went in. And they went in to find him to try to locate the team. And um, they got hit hard. And they were all wound up in a bomb crater. Every man on the team was wounded. One team member was killed in action. And George and um, the medic that was on the team with him had their boots blown off by American hand grenades. So that meant, in our minds, that the NVA had either captured or killed that team. They had American hand grenades, which are far superior to anything the Chinese had. And that was an instant opening at recon. So Spider Parks had been on that team. And he had been promoted a couple days earlier and uh, to another recon team, because he had ran four or five missions with uh, Sergeant Lane, who, Glenn Lane was the one zero. Robert Owen was the uh, one one on that team. And uh, so they returned him to Idaho. And fortunately, the interpreter, a New York Kong Hep, and Nguyen Van Sal was the Vietnamese team leader. They had missed that mission because of the rotation of transfer, and they had other people on the team that were experienced. And so we rebuilt Idaho from, from the ground up. And uh, Spider was the one one, I mean one zero, which is the team leader. Don Wilkin was the one one, and I was the radio operator. And when Spider Parks took me in <laughs> to introduce me to the team, Sal, who was the team leader, looked at me, and he whispered to Hep, he's too tall, his feet are too big, and he looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Spike Team Idaho. <laughs> so that was, and, and of course, Hep, Hep didn't tell me that until six months later. Because I kept saying, Hep, what did Sal say the day Spider introduced me to the team. Well, needless to say, um, we took the team on. We trained. We trained hard. Uh, we ran a couple of practice missions, some in-country ambushes. And uh, we hired three South Vietnamese right away. Each one was 15 years old. And within a few months, a couple of those 15-year-olds were trained up and good enough to run point for our recon team. And... Um, by August, we did our first couple of missions, which was running, uh, inserting sensor devices along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. 
We went into August, and again, we thought, we're going to the Ashaw Valley. We're going to die. Because we had heard all these stories about how bad it was, how they ran three Green Beret A camps had been flushed out of, of the valley, the Ashaw Valley, by the NVA between 65 and 66. And, there was a, and uh, it was just a fearful situation. We go in, and it was an Air Force sensor that had a major major sensor, and then it had coaxial cables that went out to two lesser ones. Everything had to be buried, put it next to the trail, so that when the NVA came by, whether it was trucks, people, or um, tanks, whatever it was, it would record the information. The Air Force would fly over, pick up the information, and we did another one like that up at Quezon. And so by that time, and then we had run another practice mission with another team parallel east of the Ashaw, went in. The other team got uh, ambushed, a Pathet Lao ambush, and our team, we just got shot at on extraction. So Spider Park goes, I can't believe you've been on four missions and you don't even have a CIB yet. <laughs> so uh, on October 5th, just so, I don't know if you all have heard about the Lynn Black mission, but October 5th, Spike Team Idaho went in, uh, sorry, Spike Team Alabama went in. They had a new team leader who was put on the team because he had rank. He had just come in from Germany and because he had the most rank, the team leader who had been training with the team was asked to stay on the team. He said, no, I'm the one zero. And if you're going to put another guy in here with, all, with no experience, I'm off. So he became the team leader. It had another man who was a little experience, was the one one, the assistant team leader. But the radio operator was Lynn Black, Lynn M. Black Jr., AKA Blackjack, that was his code name. And Lynn was, he had a previous tour of duty with the 173rd. His brother had been seriously injured and he wanted to go back to Vietnam to hurt the communists because they hurt his brother. So the team goes in, they get inserted October 5th. The first helicopter went in. The second helicopter had Lynn Black with the remaining indigenous troops. They had a total of nine men, three Americans, six indigenous. And um, when Lynn got on the ground, he said, you know, I, there's a flag right here. There's an NVA flag. This is, might be a battalion. The battalion would have about 3,000 men. We're nine. Let's get the hell out of here. And the sergeant said, sorry, I'm the team leader. We're going down this trail. And Lynn and the point man and a cowboy, uh, his real name is Khan Doan said, no, we don't walk down the trails. He goes, I'm the team leader to go down the trail. Well, he walked the team into an L-shaped ambush. They had 50 NVA up at the top. When the team walked into it, they opened fire. They killed the point man. They killed the team leader right away. And one of the members was, uh, was wounded. And everybody else on the team went down on the ground shooting at the NVA who were up on this little L-shaped ambush. And Lynn stood there just shooting them, reloading. And we only had the 20-round mags. We didn't have the 30-round that today's SF men have. And they took the shot. And well, this mission went on all day. They tried to get another helicopter in. They couldn't. They tried to get a resupply helicopter in with another King B. It got shot down. And they were experiencing wave after wave attack. At one point, they killed so many NVA that they were stacking up the dead bodies to use it as a wall against the next wave attack. And this went on <clears throat> all day. They moved. At one point, when Lynn and the team were moving, he, Lynn, was knocked out by a grenade. It destroyed his car 15, knocked him out, shredded his pants. He had multiple wounds. And Lynn remembered being awakened by Cowboy, because Cowboy was there kicking him. Come on, Black, wake up, wake up. We got a war to fight. <laughs> and he did. He got up and carried on. Later in the day, so during this whole fight, we had TAC air coming in, and they were like in the valley, and there was so much TAC air and explosives that the, they were getting smoke 
from all the ordinance, as well as some fog that came in. And this mission went on until the end of the day. A Jolly Green Giant crashed coming in to get them. Another Jolly Green came in and settled in the jungle, chopping down the trees, the treetops, and hovered for over 10 to 15 minutes, waiting for the team to get there. Lynn, as the team moved to get to the helicopter, was able to pick up um, the, uh, the pilot of the Jolly Green that had just crashed trying to get to them and one of the PJs on it. And they were able to get them, go back to the helicopter that was hovering, and they lifted everybody out. And Lynn was the last person, and he went back to get one of his teammates who was, who was severely wounded. And the teammate said, just give me your 45. And so he left in there, says, I will kill the NVA, because he, he knew he was dying from the wounds. And when Lynn ran back to the helicopter, Two young NVA jumped out in front of him and said, Chu hoy, Chu hoy. And that means surrender. And Lynn goes, Chu hoy, Chu hoy. He went up and grabbed their hot AK 47s, knocked one guy out, hit the other guy with a butt stroke, jumped on the uh, pod and lifted up into the helicopter. As they took off and the lifting out, the helicopter was surging from the B 40 rockets that were hitting the bottom of it. Lifted off, went over two mountains, and the pilot had to do an emergency landing, and they took him back. Thirty years later, they they uh, DPA what was now called DPA and went back to recover the body of the American team leader. They weren't able to locate it, but Lynn Black got a phone call from the NVA officer who was a colonel when they ambushed the team that day. And so they talked to him, and he says, hi, I'm the colonel. I was a colonel. I'm a general now. I'm in North Vietnam. I ambushed your team that day, and um, we're, we might have an anniversary. Would you want to come? And Lynn goes, uh, let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so they got talking back and forth about that historic day. And uh, so at some point, Lynn goes, you know, you, you killed three of our people that day out of our nine-man team. And he goes, well, you know, you, you inflicted between you and the Air Force and the gunships, you inflicted 90% casualties on us, either wounded in action, killed in action, or some were listed as MIAs. And Lynn goes, well, we, we saw battalions. You had 3,000 men. He goes, no, it was a division. We had 10,000 men. <laughs> so that is why that day stands out in history. And a little footnote to that, at the end, <laughs> The general goes, hey, who was the American that stood there shooting? He had the radio on his back, I think. And then goes, oh, that was me. The guy goes, you shot me three times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's why we know that, that the accuracy of that story, because Lynn talked directly to the guy that, that ambushed his team. And uh, so he gets pulled out on the, on the 5th of October. On the 6th, we get inserted into a target Echo 4. Uh, we get in early. And of course, um, when we got inserted, you know, the King Bee had a hard time landing. We were trying to land on a bomb crater. And so uh, Don Wolken went out. It's a bomb crater with elephant grass all around it. Don jumped out and disappeared. And I figured, and they always told us, you know, make sure the wheel of the king bee is on the ground before you jump. So I waited, the wheel of the king bee is on the ground. I jumped, figured I could jump a couple of feet, but I forgot I had 85 pounds on my back. I didn't reach the lip of the bomb crater. I rolled down the hill, and here's Don walking down the bottom. It took us like 15 minutes to get back up to the top. By that time, I'm sweaty. I'm ready to go home. I'm beat. <laughs> well, anyway, we proceeded on. Uh, we had been on the ground maybe an hour and a half, and all of a sudden we hear all this noise coming towards us. And the point man gives us the critical mass sign that we're going to get attacked. We're all pulling out our frag grenades. We're getting online, and a, a herd or a flock of monkeys over around us. <laughs> So put the pins back in the grenade. 
marched on. But by 2 o'clock, we had trackers. We could hear trackers, and they would shoot back and forth, signaling to each other. We weren't sure what that meant. At last light, we set up our rest overnight location, and um, we had a tracker who was probably within 20 yards of our perimeter. The last round that was fired. So we knew they were close. Had the uh, set up all night. In the morning, we got up, left at first light, moved, and again, around 2 o'clock, um, we had gone, we were going up a hillside. We could look back from where we had come because we had left the jungle and we were trying to get to a hilltop to get to our mission, which was the primary mission was an area reconnaissance. The secondary mission was we had heard that there was an American POW camp. We wanted to try to get to that camp if we could locate it. So that's what our, in our minds, that's what we wanted to do. So myself, I was near the back of the formation. Sal was the t tail gunner. I was number five man. We had a six-man team on that. Don Wolken, Jim Davison. I was the radio operator, assistant team leader. Then we had Sal, who was our, our team, Vietnamese team leader. Fook was our point man. And Hep, our, our interpreter, who always wore sunglasses day and night. And Sal and I... As the trail went up, we could look back to where we had been a half hour earlier. And there were two NVA, tall NVA. They may have been Chinese. I don't know. I get confused between ethnicities. But they both stood there in full uniform with the AKs at port arms, looking at us, smiling. So we figured something's going to go wrong here pretty soon if they're smiling and not shooting at us. <laughs> well, we, I told Don. We got to the top of a little knoll, and within 15 minutes, we got hit. We got hit with a wave attack out of the jungle. And Sal and, and Hep heard it first. We had the first round of shots. They kept coming at us. And uh, I tried to make radio contact, no radio contact, for at least two hours. And during that time, they kept coming at us. And um, we had... At one point, Don Wolken came to me. We crawled over and said, look at what they're doing. And in the jungle, you could see more darkness, and it was kind of getting taller, and they were getting the dead bodies, stacking up their dead bodies so they could get on the dead body to shoot down at us. And it was just like, welcome to, to the war. These folks are pretty serious. We had heard about the enemy, but to see it firsthand... And a lot of times when they would come out of the jungle, you would hear the AK fire first. So we wouldn't see the faces. You would see the uniform, the man, but not the face. And then at one point, when I'm firing down the hill, Fook, our point man, opened fire. And I thought he was shooting over my shoulder to support what was combating what was coming out of the jungle. And my ear was just like shattered. I just couldn't hear anything in my right ear. And um, later, when we got back the next day, we, we got together with a team. We debriefed each other. And I, and I asked Hep, I said, Hep, ask Fook, why was he shooting over my shoulder? And, he, and Hep goes, he wasn't shooting over your shoulder. He was shooting at the NVA who were aiming at you, getting ready to kill you. They were coming up your flank. And I didn't see him. And... So that whole tunnel vision thing, that's the epitome of that situation where I'm looking there, not aware of what was down the side, and if Fook hadn't taken out those NVA, I'm not sure, three or four of them, you know, we'd be Laotian fertilizer. Well, we finally, we worked TAC air for several hours. It was the first time I used an, uh, an A1 Sky Raider. They came in with a napalm run, and as he's coming in, he goes, now y'all put your head down. It's crispy critter time. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And, uh, you know, and then during the training, we were told about phantom jets. So that when a phantom makes a gun run, the bullets will get there before you hear the jet because of the speed of the jet. That's one thing to talk about. And we, when we did the in-country training, we did training with directing airstrikes, but we didn't use fast movers. Well, here it happened. And it was just so amazing to be on the ground, and all of a sudden that jungle erupts in front of us. So we directed airstrikes, we had gunships. Right about last light, 
I was down to my last two magazines, my last hand grenade, the King Bee, Captain Tin <clears throat> from the South Vietnamese Air Force, hovered for at least 10 minutes, waiting to pull us out. We finally get to the helicopter, we throw the guys on, and while I'm throwing the guys on, I look up, and Captain Tin was just sitting there like, okay, boys, anytime you're ready. Yeah, the waitress will hand out cocktails in a minute. He looked that cool. It's just like in the middle of all this that was going on because the NVA was shooting at us. We were shooting back. And the, um, that was the first time that one of the gunships came by so close on a gun run that it had the shell casings from their M60s land in the back of my neck and burnt my neck. So the first thing was, oh, shit, that, that hurts. But on the other hand, it's was like, thank you. Thank you for the pain. <laughs> well, we lifted off. And uh, as we're lifting off the jungle, because there's almost last light, so here's this dark green jungle with all these pretty little red sparkles and the green tracers <laughs> coming up at our king bee. And it was so, it looked pretty. It looked like Christmas time, you know. Red little flashing lights in the green jungle. We take off, fired the last rounds, threw down the last hand grenade, and then we turned and we flew south for a few minutes. We saw the most beautiful sunset ever. And I look over at Sal, and the Sal goes, he gave it a nod. So I made it on a team. <laughs> that was the first time in six months after I was too stupid to get on a team. <laughs> so that was my first indoctrination. I, st I was in um, our team, ran missions for a year. Uh, when I left, Lynn Black took over the team, and... Um, I was back at Fort Devens, hated being at Fort Devens, uh, went down to Bill Alexander like many of our other guys have, got the orders cut, went back, got on RT Idaho again. Lynn Black was there. He took the team, and we took turns running missions back and forth for a while, and then he, they yanked him and said, um, we, need, we need you to have more recon guys. So Lynn went on some special assignments with Mac V. Sog out of Saigon, working with Speedy Gaspard. And George Jr. is here today, and his lovely wife Susie. Is, unfortunately, we lost Speedy a few years ago, but he's one of our great officers that, that we knew then. And uh, so I came back, got on the team, uh, we ran more missions, and uh, I forget if I have an hour, but I would rather, if there's any questions or anything from anybody here, particularly with our SF guys, because you know, one thing about SOG, we never spent time at A camps. And some people have said, well, wouldn't you like to have been at an A camp? You were safe, you had, you had artillery, you had support, you could get conventional troops. And I'll tell you what, I know about our A camps. Those guys are in their pay. You know, Charlie's here from 109, Captain John Duffy, who was my uh, XO at training group, or Jim Duffy, and uh, sorry, Jim. But uh, they, he's here today. He was here a minute ago. So we're going through training group. They were at A Camp 109. And they were under siege for weeks. And just thinking that you're sitting in the camp getting mortared. Anyways, I was glad to be in SOG. We had our different contingencies to deal with. But uh, the men at the A Camps, they all earned our respect. And you know, it was funny because, uh, not funny, but the parallels between us. In SOG, we worked with indigenous troops like SF is trained to this day. And then the A camps had their little people they worked with. Now, I was lucky. Our Vietnamese and our team were fearless. They knew their government in South Vietnam was corrupt. They knew it. But they preferred to live with a government that was corrupt that they knew they could live with than to be under the thumb of the communists. And people, particularly some of these younger generations today, I wish they could talk to them to hear their story, what it's like to live under communism. And we got a young lady sitting right here who's written a book. Tan, would you stand up for a minute, please? Because if anybody has any doubt about living under the thumb, thank you, under the thumb of communism, she was a young girl in her village before April 30th, 1975, the day that all of us Vietnam vets remember and hate and dread in her village. She saw the difference 
of what it was like to live in a thriving village. And then what happened when those goddamn communists came in, took it over, and ruined it. Like they do everything else they touch. Eventually, her parents had to decide who amongst their family was going to be put on a boat to leave. She was one of the two children. It was a long, arduous trip. At one point, she was so ill and sick, she was lying next to her grave that they had dug for her. Somehow she survived. And I encourage everybody to purchase her book because it's just heartwarming and revealing as to the truth of communism. For myself, I was, yes, sir. On that note, there's a book by James Michener called The Bridge of Andal, and he went to this uh, place in Austria that was a crossing point during the Hungarian Revolution, and he interviewed a whole bunch of Hungarians who were escaping, and he paints a picture of life in Hungary under, under communist domination. I agree, because if anything, we have a mission. When we go home, we got to tell anybody who will, t who will listen to us, particularly the younger generations who are getting their brains washed in college these days, about what, how good our country is as opposed to communism. Absolutely. And, yes, sir? Uh, yeah, just sure. Yes, sir. We signed the agreements. Part of our signature was to support the South Vietnamese after we passed. Uh, I was uh, entering the Euro's <clears throat> time, and at the time it was a Democratic Congress. Right. And they turned around and cut all our funding and would not allow us to buy any more missions past the 15th of August, 1973. Right. Well, once we announced the date, which we did, and said the money's cut, all the uh, RPGs that are trying to sink all the ships, they went on R&R &R for a month in July. Because they knew we were going to say that. That's why we never give a date, or never should give a date for anything we do. And, on a, and we knew what was going to happen on August 16th, and it did. Nobody here is going to argue with you about that. <laughs> I agree. Just like we did in Iraq, and just like we did last month. Yes, sir. End of story. End of story. Anyways, I thank you, sir. Um, for myself, we had other missions and um, other times where I'm not sure how many have read the books, but um, getting back to getting the word out to the public. The new, the new way of getting word out is going to be podcasting. I'm just speaking from a personal experience. Uh, a couple years ago, I was put in contact with a Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink, who does podcasts. I'm not sure if anybody here is aware of Jocko and his podcast, but anybody who's not, Jocko was a Navy SEAL, started out as an enlisted, 
became an officer, and he had two tours of duty in Iraq. His second tour of duty, he was the OIC for uh, Task Force Bruiser. And Jocko um, began doing podcasts. He's done leadership books and other things. He's big on jujitsu. So I had my first interview with him in June of 2019. And he became enamored with the SOG stories that we talked, written about, as well as special forces. And the very first podcast, as of last week, has 715,000 views. And the thing that about, I'm not like trying to say that because of anything about Jocko or I, but that is the, the wave of the future for getting to our young people. Because I, today I get emails, Instagram, things like that from literally around the world as the, the positive side of this. And I'm hoping that in the months and years ahead that we can figure out ways to get the technology there to, to learn about that and to get the word out because there are younger people that are not brainwashed by the schools, but they need to have some history. And through our podcast, and then Jocko is also bankrolling a podcast where I'm interviewing SOG veterans. And we've done, I did three over the last two days. There's a total of 16 in the can. He's published nine. You can go to Spotify or Apple and the podcasts are there. My business card uh, or my website, you can get links to those. But I'm just mentioning that because this hopefully will be a, something that we can learn to use to get the word out to young people. And, um, you know, during my time in SOG, which was a total of 19 months, when I went back, I was there until April, until April 1970. And we had a, a commanding officer who was just in, he was in SOG to get as many medals as he could. And he didn't understand Special Forces, he didn't appreciate SOG or what we were up against. And for example, we kept begging for better radios. And we never realized how compromised we were. Uh, years later, after the war ended, um, the CIA had gone into East Berlin. They went in before the wall fell and then afterwards. And um, they interviewed some of the Russians who were there, and the Russians told them how they were in Laos and Cambodia monitoring our frequencies. And they said, we kept thinking those Green Berets were going to get better, more sophisticated radios. But they never did. We monitored them. And that was one of the levels that we were compromised. Further, we never realized that when the USS Pueblo was captured in, in North Korea in November of 1970, the, they did that at the behest of the Russians. The Russians came in and took out all of the latest technical equipment and took it to Cambodia where they set up, and at the time, Johnny Walker spy ring was back in Washington, D.C., handing over the daily codes to the Russians and getting paid for that. So at some point for several years, the teams on the ground were compromised more than we ever realized. And CCS, all of our different FOBs. And um, one example of that would be, we had a recon team, Pat Eddington, who was Asian in appearance. He was, I think he was from Maine. He had a team of all NVA. They had a mission to go to an NVA POW camp where they had Americans captured. Pat was on the ground moving towards that camp when on the open frequency, on their frequency, a voice in English came up and said, Sergeant Eddington, we know who you are. We know that you're RT crate. Your 1-1 one -one is, and we're telling you, you have to, you've got a choice to make. If you continue with your mission, I will kill every American in this POW camp before you get here. So you've got a choice. You can turn around and get out or continue on and come and count the dead bodies. So Pat turned around and left. But that gives you one example of how compromised it was. On another time, 
we were descending into an LZ in Laos. And somehow, to this day, I'll never figure it out, you know, divine intervention. Sal or Fook, I forget, one of my team members, so we're going down, the, the king bees used to spiral in. And as we were spiraling, Fook or Sal yelled to the door gunner because we were flying in a king bee, and he stopped descending and pulled out. What had happened was he saw a wire across the LZ. How he saw it, I'll never know. But they came back and they uh, hit it, and there was a 500-pound bomb attached to that wire. Had we hit it, the 500-pound bomb would have detonated and just totally destroyed our King Bee. So those are a couple examples of just how compromised we were. Another time, Lynn Black was on the ground, and a voice came up. He, he was Cuban, and a Cuban was talking to the team. At first, the Doug Letourneau was the radio operator, and Doug was, this guy goes, I know that you're on RT Idaho. Lynn Black is the one zero. You're the Frenchman, Doug Letourneau. And he did not mention the fact that there had been a third member of the team. When a third member of the team had gone home on d -Rose seven days earlier, this Cuban knew that he had left. And he says, you and Lynn Black, here's your coordinates. Here's your six-digit coordinates. Well, Lynn goes, who are you talking to? And he says, give me that. So Lynn starts talking to this guy. And the guy goes, I know where you are. We're going to come get you. And Lynn goes, well, he knew he had high ground. He says, let me give you my eight-digit coordinate. Come and get us, mother bleeper. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, by the way, your mother must be a piss-poor whore. Because if your mother was a good whore, you would have gotten a job in the United States. But because she's a piss-poor whore, you landed here in Laos. So your mother is bad like you are. Come and get me. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways... <laughs> the, uh, there's a couple, you know, uh, as a sidebar to, we had the privilege of working with Marine Corps air, air guns and other door gunners. And again, I'm alive today just thanks to the team members, the South Vietnamese Air Force, and the tactical air and the gunship crews that we had. And the Marine Corps, when we got there in 68, they had the old gunships that could barely get off the ground. The door gunners used to get out and try to lift the helicopter, push it down, just to get it going. And once it got a little motion, they jump back in and, and lift off. And we had the muskets that did the same thing. And uh, the Marine Corps, you know, when you're in the States, there's this inter-service rivalry. Marines are the best in the Navy. And of course, we all know who's really the best. And so, <laughs> but when you get across the fence and we're dealing with the enemy, it was all on the same side. And we had amazing support. And um, many times, uh, we would have Air Force, the SPADs would come in. And uh, Jack Singlob was our uh, commander for two years, from 66 to 68. And during that time, they had to fight to keep the air assets attached to us. But it all paid off. And today, I mean, we can say we now know. We didn't realize at the time. Basag had the highest casualty rate of the entire war. It exceeded 100%. And so if, when I first heard that, I'm going, being a skeptical lad that I am, I said, how can that be? Well, people like Bob Howard, who earned the Medal of Honor in 1968, running missions out of Contum and CCC, he was put in for 11 Purple Hearts. He received eight. And others, many of our men had multiple Purple Hearts. And so they were either wounded or killed in action, or today are amongst the 50 Green Berets that are still missing in action in Laos. And so that was how devastating the war was, which we didn't realize at the time. And again, for the inter-service part of it, um, we had one mission where we were inserted. They searched for us at night with dogs, and we were deep into underbrush where they didn't find us. The next day, we, we literally hiked up a straight face of a mountain for the entire day. We had no rope, no rope climbing equipment, and we had six-foot sections of rope for our Swiss seats, and the Swiss seats would be used for extraction. We had to tie those together and climb up the mountain one 
bag at a time with our rucksacks and then climb up to the next level, the next level. We got to the top at last light, stayed in the RON during the night. And in the morning when we woke up, we looked down and there was this beautiful field of wild orchids. It was just spectacular. So the guys are like <laughs> cutting the orchids off, putting them in their ears, and we had this little, <laughs> this little moment. And I used to work at a floor shop when I was in high school and uh, for, the, for weekends, you know, get a little extra pay. I said, God, if Johnny Alanuski were here now, we'd make a fortune. <laughs> well, later in that day, we had moved parallel to the ridge line, and we were trying to get to our mission, which was to uh, photograph and, and to mine and possibly blow up a uh, new bridge that they were using. And uh, we had moved parallel to a steep ridge, and there was like a little plateau. And we took a break along that plateau, and then as we started to go downhill, the point man ran into some enemy. We came back up. So that trail was very narrow, and there was a long trail that came down to the little plateau where we were. Well, we made that contact, called for the radio operators, got on the radio, Covey came in, and we had some combat contact for an hour or two. And then we called for an extraction. The weather was socked in in Vietnam, so the helicopters had to come from Thailand, which is over a two-hour flight. So we're holding, it's not like a major battle, but they were looking for us, and we had minimal contact. We threw hand grenades down. At one point, um, I was on the side of the hill directing an airstrike, and I saw 200 yards or so away an enemy climb up into a tree, and that somebody handed him an RPG, and I could tell from the RPG that it wasn't loaded. And so I put in my gun sights, and you know, I'm sitting there going, I could hear my third grade Sunday school teacher, Myrtle Reichert, saying, thou shalt not kill. And it's like things that happen in your mind. Anyways, at some point, they gave him the rocket. He put it in, and then Sohn, our point man for that mission, had got up to, to do something. The NVA saw him, and so I pulled the trigger one time and blew him out of the tree. And then later that night, um, the helicopters came at about last light. They couldn't pull us out. Something happened. The Air Force turned around and went home. So I told the team, take a break. I, I took a nap for a couple of hours. And when I woke up, John Engels goes, you won't believe this. On that trail, there was a string of lights from the top coming down. On the trail below, there was a string of lights coming up. In the valley, we had valleys on both sides. There were trucks trucking in people. On the plateau across, there were more trucks coming. And we said, oh my, <laughs> this is gonna be a long night. But the first Spectre arrived, and when Spectre came in, he came in, and I, you know, what we did, we had our M79, we put our uh, strobe light in it and aimed at Spectre. That's what we've been trained to do. We've done it that way before in other missions. He goes, I can't see your light, there's too many lights. So I said, well, you see the road, move to the west or whatever it was. We're going to get on the east side of this mountain. I'm turning off my strobe light. You get the rest. And he did. He killed many enemies. And within a short period of time, all of the light lanterns went out. They were either destroyed or blown out. And we went through three or four specters that night. And by the second specter, they were coming so close that we had to call the rounds them within 25 to 30 meters of our position because we could hear them. We could hear them crawling up. Then by the third specter, when it got expended, we, ran, we had run out of uh, specter rounds. They ran out of lights in the uh, flare ship. So we began to play a game with the NVA. They were crawling up. You could hear them crawling. We'd throw a hand grenade. Then they scurry back, you hear them, they come back again. Well, we were getting low on hand grenades. So Sal and uh, Chow went out and they gathered rocks. So we would throw rocks and you hear them scurry away from the rocks. So the game was, guess who's gonna throw a hand grenade or not? <laughs> Anyways, that went on and we finally had one more specter that came in and in the morning the Air Force came in and pulled us out. 
So that was another one of those missions that's really different where we only fired three or four magazines at night because the contact was so close. We didn't want to let the enemy know exactly where we were. They kind of knew where we were, but the Air Force, the best Air Force in the world came and saved our bacon. So I am at the one hour mark here, and I'm not sure if we're, if we're allowed to go on. I can talk for a little while longer or answer any questions. And uh, one of our uh, longtime uh, represent member of the SOA and the SFA, Steve Sherman, asked me to announce that he also has uh, for sale his MACV SOG annexes to the MACV Command Histories from 1964 to 73, nine volumes. He's got 50 numbered sets. If you buy them now here, it's 180 bucks during the convention. If you buy them later from his website, it's $200. But I wanted to get that public service announcement in. And right now, nobody else has thrown me out of here. So until they throw us out, I'm happy to stay here, answer more questions. Charlie. Yes, sir. And his is October 5th. 5th, yes, sir. I've read that account in your book. And after reading it, I've always wondered why he was never nominated for Medal of The reason why he wasn't nominated was because the team leader who was killed had been a member of 10 Special Forces Group. And the S3 that we had at that time had been a member of the 10 Special Forces Group. They were friends. And he ordered Lynn Black to go back and get the body. Well, by the time that order came down, Lynn had left the team, I mean, left the area where the, where the one zero had been killed. And they had stripped his magazines, and they knew they were going to need him. And uh, they weren't able to get back to the body. And the S3 shop, the officer there, was bitter that they didn't bring back his friend. And Lynn said, well, we'll get the people out who are alive. So Lynn made the right decision, and he should have been the Medal of Honor. He was knocked out, knocked unconscious. He passed up the wounded, because Cowboy had multiple wounds that day. And Lynn Black had passed him up, and, uh, and it's just one of those injustices of life. But Lynn's happy to be alive. He's still alive today up in Washington, and he's still busy as an artist. He's been fighting Parkinson's for 20 years. And Lynn Back is fighting it on his own terms. He does very physical. He gets out there every day, cuts down wood, trees, and moves on with life. But um, great guy. Just a, and he's a fabulous artist. He said during my second tour, he got a, a charcoal, and he bought a little pad. And he would come in. Each of our team members would come by. He would sketch their, he'd do a quick sketching of each of the men. He would give them their personal portraits. I would give my left arm to find one of those portraits today. And, uh, and, and another question that's been asked often is, what's the status of our team members? Well, when April 30th came, the only person who got out from my recon team was Hep, the interpreter. And Hep had uh, family members who were able to get him passes to an Air Force base in Saigon. And when he got to the uh, base, his wife was there with him. And they had a C-130, and the tailgate was half up, and the plane was starting to move. And Hep threw his child up to somebody who caught the child. He pushed his wife up. As he pushed his wife up, he fell down. He got up and started running. He ran up, got alongside the uh, C-130 as this taxi, and an arm came out and grabbed Hep, picked him up, and pulled him into the C-130. They were able to get out, and... Uh, he ended up in uh, Houston, Texas. Sadly, we uh, buried him uh, three years ago in Houston. Uh, he passed away from a heart issue there. But uh, he was the only one that got out. The remaining of the people on the team were not able to get out. We tried to get money into him. But, you know, uh, unlike today, with the Afghanistan situation, we have our SF veterans, people working together through the Internet, social media, or whatever, behind the scenes, bringing home good quality people, um, we couldn't do anything. And myself, and on that day, was I had been working at a newspaper for three, three months, and I just went in the restroom and just sat there and cried. 
It was a painful day. John, you got a question? Oh. <laughs> uh, we had the Special Operations Association reunion um, earlier this week from Monday through Thursday. And Thursday morning, we had a King Bee Symposium. And the King Bees were, again, the South Vietnamese Air Force. And they, they were just amazing, fearless men. I'm alive today thanks to their, to their skill sets, aviation skills, and they're just they're completely fearless men. Um, and that was, for me, a very emotional time. For any of the recon guys, any men who served in SOG, particularly at FOB1, FOB2, and FOB3, because we had, in 68, there were six FOBs. One was FUBAI, which was up in the i -Corps. Three was Quezon. And of course, you read the books about Quezon. It always talks about the Marine Corps, this, Marine Corps, that. Well, we had FOB3 there, and they were still running missions, both across the fence and on the ground. They did security patrols out. On uh, one of their patrols, Pat Watkins had his recon team. They went outside, went down, and his brew were fishing. And they threw some hand grenades in, killed a bunch of fish, brought them back. <laughs> they came back into their base, and they had a good, good fish uh, dinner that night. The next day, the Marine Corps went out and got hammered. They had, had, I forget how many of their Marines were killed and wounded that day. And at near the end of the day, uh, the CO told Pat Watkins, who was the one zero of that team, said, come back, you gotta see this. He came down and the NVA captain who had, who had ambushed the Marines was sitting there and when Pat Watkins walked in, the NVA pointed at him like this. And through an interpreter, the NVA told him, you were in our kill zone yesterday, but we don't want to kill you because it's just two Green Berets with a bunch of mercenaries. We wanted to get casualties to count it. Just think about that one for a second. And so Pat was very fortunate to get out of it. Of course, Pat Watkins had a mission which is one of those legendary missions where they were in a target which was Oscar 8, which was, which was our most severe target up in i -Corps. And they were inserted, the helicopter that inserted them got shot down, but they were able to escape and evade that day. During the night, they did a trail watch. And the trail watch went on for several hours of NVA troops, tanks, a bulldozer, Everything heading south into Vietnam to the war zone. And, you know, Pat was there. He had one or two of his indigenous troop members with him. At one point, one of the troop members, the, uh, one of the uh, indig came up to Pat. His eyes are like this. He goes, we go now. And Pat didn't understand what he said. He said, why? And the, and the guy was so excited. What the reason was, an NVA come up to him and said, it's your turn for guard duty. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of those moments in time. <laughs> so at first light, Pat and his team moved out. They were in, in, in contact all day. And on my second book, On the Ground, this is the first story in the book, but they were in contact, back and forth all day with the NVA. There had been a couple of attempts to get helicopters in. They couldn't. At last light, King Bee came in with Captain On, and Captain On today has two hooks on his hands. And the reason why he has the two hooks is that he had inserted a team in Laos, and when he's leaving, he got, had anti-aircraft fire, and they hit the fuel cell, and the fuel cell ignited flames in the aircraft, and with the King Bee, you have the tail section where the passengers are, and the pilot and the co-pilot are higher up. So when you're sitting here, you can see their feet moving. Well, they were catching on fire. His clothes were burning. He said, I could have landed right away, but I knew that if I landed there, it would be the, the NVA. I flew over one more mountain, and he forced the King Bee to crash land. And when he got out, he couldn't, his head, so much burned, his pants were burned off. And he, when he went to open the window, the skin of his hands came off. He had to use an elbow to get out the window 
and he had been so severely damaged, he had to cut both of his hands off. But he knew it was going to be bad, but he would rather be burnt badly than to sit there with the communists. And so that day with Pat Watkins, which was June 1968, he could hear the King B come, and the King B came in, and it was just Major on by himself, no co-pilot. He came in, and there were, the team was now in a bomb crater. And he came in with that King B, hovered down, and settled into it. And the way it's been explained is like a mother hen sitting on her nest. And she hovered, he hovered that thing there while under enemy fire. The team gets on. As they're leaving, they still continue to forward because, and he had to jute to get past anti-aircraft fire because the NVA had, by this time, had Russian uh, anti-aircraft. You know, you've seen the World War II movies. We were flying over Germany. See the anti-aircraft, act, act, act like that. Well, he was juting around those anti-aircraft kind of attempts to blow them out of the sky, but he got the team back. And that's just another day with a, a, a King Bee pilot that is just <clears throat> amazing. And that's why we have such a, an emotional link to our King Bees. And in our case, that was the only Air Force we had. Uh, for us, for, the, for my first uh, six months at, at Fubai, and eventually... We closed Fubai in January of 69, went down to CCN, and then we began to work more on occasions with the 101st Airborne and other helicopter units, but we always loved our King Bees. And um, again, myself and other SOG guys are alive today, thanks to them and our, to our indigenous troops. You know, we never, on my team, we never had the problem of uh, the troops turning on us because we had a vetting system where our South Vietnamese vetted the team members that came on the team. And God was with us. You know, our team went on for over four years. And the last one zero for Idaho was Ken Bore, who was a lieutenant at the time. And Ken went on to become a two-star general. He served in Delta both as a platoon leader, just a squad member, ultimately the officer in charge. He was also the commanding officer for 5th Group and other assignments, and he recently retired, and he's still working and getting the stories out today. Um, and one of our little projects, we have a, uh, there's a video game out. It's called Sog Prairie Fire, and this video game is out, and Ken and I have worked with some background, and it's the most realistic video game. I'm, by, I'm not a gamer by any stretch of the imagination, but we've worked with them, and they've made a $3,000 contribution to the SOA and have pledged to do more uh, donations to the SOA through what they've done there. Um, and this video game is going to go on for years. They're going to improve it and do more games. And they're based off of SOG stories. So I'm not a gamer, like I said, but what little I've seen of it has been very impressive. And Ken Bore has been a, a, one of the major participants with that. And for myself, my website is SOG Chronicles. You can go there. You can see I've done eight interviews with Jocko. And these podcasts are amazing. I'm biased, of course. And then now I'm doing SOGcast, where I'm interviewing people that have either SOG people or like Mitch Utterback. We interviewed him today. And thank you again, Mitch, because Mitch was able to link our history with the OSS and Jack Singlob, of course, our patron saint for Special Forces, who turned 100 on uh, July the 10th in Franklin, Tennessee. And so those will all be available on my website. The books are there. And um, I don't want to go on any more questions from, um, I'm feeling uneasy being one of the SF guys. You know, I just feel like you guys should be up here. Because if nothing else, every Green Beret I've ever talked to, you have your story. Or our aviators are here. Each of you have your story. And they're significant. If nothing else, you should write them down. Force yourself to write those stories down because your children and your grandchildren want to know. Because when we're pushing up daisies someday, they're going to ask, what did dad do in the war? Or what did granddad do? And my message is I encourage you to do it. Whether you just sit down to, now with the computers, you can talk into the computer. Marcus Witt and I were chatting about that a while back. And I said, look, you don't have to write, Marcus. You can just talk into the damn computer. 
<laughs> Have you started it yet, Marcus? No. <laughs> Anyways, but I really encourage you to do this because I've every SF man I've ever met, once we get talking, everybody's got their story. That's just to me it's amazing. We have some similarities and each generation of special forces that comes along. When I meet these young men today, God, it's just so awesome to talk to them. And our SFA chapter has been working with the SWIC, the training group, and we, we, we pay for the barbecue down there now. And we go down and meet these young Green Berets the day uh, before they get there, uh, before they get officially awarded the Green Beret. And it's amazing. They're quicker, smarter, brighter, almost as handsome as we are. <laughs> But that tradition goes on, and I'll tell you, you meet these young Green Berets, within two minutes we're talking. And if we meet the past generation, it's such an honor, because the generations after SOG, after the Vietnam War, those men stepped up to the plate, they went where they were sent, and they served with great distinguished honor. And we have our small special forces world that, in my mind, nothing like it. And I'm honored to be a part of that. I'll be here. I'm going to stay here throughout the reunion. Um, I'll be stationed over at the SOA table. If you come in, turn left. Down at the end, I'll be there uh, tomorrow on and off, depending on who's speaking. And if you turn right, Steve Sherman's there with his books. And it's just an honor to be here. If there's no more questions, or if you want a couple more. Yes, sir, one more. Well, no more hungry, though. Um, the intel we had prior to most missions sucked. <laughs> and the answer. Sometimes it was pretty good, but remember, it came from the CIA or DIA. And on, back in November of 68, we were TDY down at camp to uh, FOB 6. They were running missions into Cambodia at the time. And the night before the target, our mission was to find three NVA divisions. That's 10,000 men each. The first, the third, and the seventh NVA divisions were missing in action. The CIA, DIA, and anybody else could not find or locate them. So they said, your six-man recon team, go find them. So the night before that mission, we had intel reports, had photographs, and aerial photographs, which is the beginning of having uh, high resolution photos from 70,000 feet. So it was either U2s, I thought it was Blackbirds. And we looked at those intel reports with the latest word. The next day, we got on the ground with our six man team. We were on the ground for a while. We literally walked into a base camp. The fires were still growing. And there was one fire that had a pot on it. And as we're there, the tail element from one uh, division came back towards us and the point element for another came back and the image I'll take to my grave is the image of NVA running at port arms and their pith helmets on and because um, in Cambodia it wasn't triple canopy there it was you could see two or three hundred yards away and they came at us and we were on a race to get back uh, we used claymores we had claymore mines with five second fuses we came back and that slowed them down enough and then the 20th uh, Special Operations uh, Squadron, the Green Hornets, got there with their miniguns, gave us more time to get to the helicopters. As we left, they were coming out of the jungle at us and barely got out of there on Thanksgiving Day, 1968. So in answer to your question, that day, we had good intel. On other missions, there were times when they would say, here's your folder, this is your target, open it up, and it would be just your basic stuff, and that would be nothing more. And there were times when we would just say, this is your target today. Go get it, do an area mission or blow up a pipeline. Because our missions varied everything from general and point mission. A point mission would be, be get on the ground, get to a target, like a, a telephone wires, and do a wiretap. A general recon just to see what the hell the communists are doing, because we were the early warning device. And the reason why we had a secret war was because our government, in its infinite wisdom, in the early 60s said, we will have no combat troops in Laos or Cambodia. The communists said the same thing. But when that accord was reached, 
the NVA had been coming south for five years already, rebuilding the Ho Chi Minh Trail, infiltrating their agents into South Vietnam. And there's some journalists that keep saying, oh, it's just the Viet Cong. No, they're the local peasants that rose up and just fought those, those American bastards. Well, no, the NVA were there. And yes, there were some old Viet Cong units that were around that were strong from the day, but the NVA was in there and they were deep into that. And uh, that program was going on. That's why we had the secret war. And that's, they came at us. By, the, by 1968, the NVA were putting together sapper teams. These sapper teams' sole mission was to find us and to kill the Americans, not the indige, because they knew there was a psychological impact to that, which it had. On January 1st, we had a recon team up in our MA target, and they got hit in the first light, and all the Americans were killed. The indige were allowed to live. And we had another team that was wiped out, RT Oregon, on November 10th, 1969. Two Americans on the ground, Randy Suber, Ron Ray, and their indige, the indige all lived. One was killed when he was walking out. A Marine killed him because he saw a South Vietnamese with a weapon. Didn't realize that he was uh, one of ours. And, um, you know, they, they, they came at us hard. But, again, we're very fortunate, in my case, to be here today. Any other questions? If not, I'll be at my table for the next couple of days. Um, my website is, is uh, sogchronicles.com. You can go in there, and we have email address and anything else. Thank you all for being here. Take care.